o no. Bueno. You ready to start? You want to start a little bit earlier?
des y cofundador de Subatomic Studios. Ellos son famosos por su juego Field Runners. Field Runners fue eh, presentado por Steve Jobs en el Apple Keynote del 2010 y también fue portada de, del Time Magazine eh, en el 2008 como parte de los 10 mejores juegos del 2008. Entonces démosle la bienvenida, por favor. Hello. Um, so before I get started, I um, just want to say this is my very first time to Bogota, to Colombia, uh, to South America, and actually <laughs> um, I had my very first coffee two days ago, and so I figured what better place to have it than in Colombia. So I'm um, really excited to be here. I'm going to try not to stand in front of my slides. Um, and also before I, I get into introducing myself and what I've done, I, I noticed that um, a lot of the speakers here have, um, are coming from all different walks of our profession and I haven't actually seen many developers. So I'm a developer, I make games and I'm going to tell you guys on how we made money making games and um, hopefully it'll help you guys uh, do the same. So before I move on, um, by a show of hands, um, how many of you here are either making games or are interested in making games? Okay. That's what I was hoping for. I was uh, hoping like you guys weren't lost or something. And then how many of you, have, and this may sound pretty obvious, are interested in making money? <laughs> I know it's kind of a silly question, but that's the whole point of the talk today. So um, I figured this is a lot of really complicated way of saying something simple. So. Um, I'm really going to be talking today about how to make money making games. So my background, um, so I'm the CEO of Subatomic Studios as, as was already introduced. Um, we actually formed back in 2008, right when the iPhone App Store first launched. We actually uh, started our studio, uh, there was two of us, and we started, um, I think it was like March of that year. So we saw the, uh, the iPhone as a great opportunity to um, bring our games to because we were prior to um, working for working on iPhone games we were working in the console space on PC and Xbox and stuff like that and it was very difficult to get your games out on those platforms but when uh, the big announcement came out that year when Steve Jobs came out on stage and says this platform right thank you um, this platform is going to be free to, for all developers and open to all developers. So you can put in, well, just about anything that you'd like onto our store. We saw it as a great opportunity to uh, take advantage of that. And us being developers and having had experience making games, we saw we, this is something we were very interested in. And I guess we, it kind of worked out for us. We, took, uh, we bet on the right horse and uh, actually um, we got, uh, it did very well. So... Um, Today we're about 30 people. And when we first formed, we were actually virtual. So um, my one business partner is from Russia, and my other business partner is from Brazil. So uh, we were working from all over the globe, and we started hiring a lot of people from all over the world. Uh, we have people in China, Egypt, like I said, Brazil, um, Bulgaria, uh, Germany, um, and like all different kind of places. So, and that's also why I'm interested uh, in Colombia because it's now an up and coming games market and there's uh, a lot of interest in, on our side to kind of look for people and talent here to help us build our games. Um, I'll try to, oops. So um, the games that we did, um, we, we take a different approach than most studios. We spent a very long time building our games. Like I said, we formed back in 2008 and we made this game called Field Runners. It was built in about six months' time, and there's two of us. Uh, eventually, we've, we brought on a third person. I'm going to go into some screenshots later because I know that it's a little hard to see here. Um, but um, we built that game, we released it, but we felt that we didn't really provide uh, the content that you players come to expect from console and PC titles. When we launched the game, we had no sound, no music, and we had one level. We really didn't think that the game was going to do well. We actually, at the very end, we were even thinking of just stopping development on it because we were so burnt out on working on it. We were working a day job as well as working on this game, and it was a very challenging thing. Um, but we put it out there, and it was very well received, and we were very happy, and so we continued for several years after to keep building that game. We had no experience running a company, I, I should say. Um, so down here, I'm entirely self-taught. I mean, I, I have a professional background in engineering and programming, but I know nothing about running a business. And I, I want to preface this whole talk with the fact that I don't have a financial background. I'm going to be telling you guys my experience with um, of what I've learned that works 
with games. So um, it's like I said, I studied computer science in school. Um, and we actually, there was one other game that we worked on. It was a work for hire. We got paid to do it. Um, it was actually, if you guys know Autodesk, Autodesk, they make 3DS Max and Maya. Um, we made their first video game, and it was for the iPhone and iPad, and it did very, very well. And they were very proud, and that's it down there in the bottom right corner. Um, so Field Runners 2 was actually built, and here's some screenshots. Field Runners 2, this took 19 months to build, and it was about 25 people. So it was a very expensive project, and we were getting very nervous because as it was getting close to the end, there was so much more stuff, and the market has evolved so much over that time that it was scary um, to see if it would even make the, or the money that we put into it back. But it did, and, and even then some. So we were very happy and very proud. So it's a tower defense game. For those of you who don't know about field runners or just tower defense in general, essentially, it's a, uh, if you've heard of StarCraft or WarCraft, it's that kind of game, but just simplified. It's, you take out the element of actually manipulating each of the characters, and all, you only focus on building buildings. And so in our game, it's a very simple concept. Uh, concept. We have uh, invading forces that come in, and you're there to try to defeat them before they escape. So. Um, what do all games that make money have in common? I mean, this is a big question, and like, there's so many different games out there, and so I think it's important for us to take a look at this first before we jump into seeing what worked for us. So it's definitely not genre. Um, you look at the top grossing games, and these were, I think, pulled from last week. Uh, we have like gambling games, you have your sandbox adventure, puzzle games, and strategy games. There's nothing in common there, and they're all in the top grossing charts. So that's not it, so what can it be? Well, it's definitely not quality either. So a lot of people think quality, just keep putting quality. We invest in quality, we believe in quality, but quality isn't the only thing that sells. There's this game called Pooh, which you guys may or may not have seen on the store. It's been on the top grossing charts for a while, and as you can see, like, it's very simple art, and it works. It appeals to the audience that, um, it appeals to what people are looking for in that market. And same thing with this game called Hill Climb Racing. I think it's fairly new, but it's also in top grossing. And it's not price either. So um, you look at all these games, they range from free to very expensive, and they're all in top grossing. So if it's none of the above, then what the heck can it be? So I'm going to take a look, and I'm going to reveal a little bit of our secret sauce and what we do to try to identify what works. So we don't just go in blindly and make a game. And actually, <laughs> I should preface this as this is what we used to do, and then we kind of got smart about it. Over the years, we've come to learn that you're taking on a big risk by just going in and just making the game that you want to make and then thinking about how to make money from it later. It's best to look and identify how to make money first and so you can kind of build the game around that. So our secret sauce, so identifying effective models. Um, App Annie, if you guys have never heard of App Annie, I highly, highly, highly recommend that you check it out. It's free, it's a website, you go there, it's public, I mean they track all this kind of statistics on games um, on a like hourly basis, and it's all this public knowledge that you can use to see and identify games that do very well. And I'm going to show you, and we're going to walk you through a little bit of our thinking process when we look at some of these games through Rep Annie. So what you're going to want to pay a particular attention to um, on the next few slides is like the correlation between the download ranks and the grossing ranks. So the download ranks are the number of units of games that are either purchased or downloaded. If it's a free game, it's the number of times that they were downloaded, and the grossing is how much, like where they fall with, on, in relation to all the other games out there, how much money they make. So we're first gonna take a look at Field Runner 2, why not? It's, uh, it's our game, so I can speak on that uh, the best, and this is public information, so you can just go and pull it down yourself if you're interested. Apologize that the chart kind of goes off a little bit, trails off on the side there, they think our, the presentation is a little cut off. So you'll see that, with this one, um, let's see here, I think uh, there's a laser, yeah, there's layer pointer. So over here, um, this is how many downloads of the game we've had since we launched. We launched last July, on July 19th, and you see we had a pretty good, I mean, we have a pretty uh, gradual trend, downward trend here, but our, we have a very close correlation. The number of units that our game, uh, people buy, um, is closely tied to the amount of money we make. Um, and I should also mention that like, Field Runners 2 is not just a premium game. I, I know other people have spoke on this yesterday, but we sell things in our game, and we call this premium. Um, we make more than half of our money, more than half of our money from the stuff that we sell in the game. 
So it works very well for us, and I'm going to talk about that a little bit later. But so you can see um, from here, like we have a very cl uh, close uh, correlation. Um, so our monetization relies heavily on our number of downloads, which you would think for most games that would be the case, but I'm going to prove the contrary. So there's this game right here, and this is just a, the complete opposite example. This is a pretty new game. You can see, I think it just came out like a week ago or something. Um, but it had a large number of downloads, and you can see they're on the top grossing chart. Or, sorry, top uh, down, uh, download chart. They're like very top, but they're barely making any money. I mean, it's decent money for what it is, but they clearly don't have any real good monetization hooks. Because if they did, this would look very different. I mean, you can even see, like, we are... Uh, we're kind of already pretty far down on the charts. We're, we've been falling over the past year, and we still are making well more money than they have been. So they clearly were thinking about making a game first and not really thinking about how to monetize it. So in my mind, this is a bad monetization model, and I wouldn't look at this game to try to find out how to make money from making games. Here's another interesting, very interesting example. Very few games follow this curve, but this is very powerful. So I don't know if you guys heard of this game called Rage of Bahamut, but you see here on the left, it, like, it's, it came out and it, it jumped to the top of the charts, got pretty close, but fell well, way off. I mean, and I should point out, we're looking at the blue line mostly. These are, so the different lines, the different colors represent different categories of games. So like here, I think, uh, so the red is the, uh, the position in the games category, and the yellow is in the card games category, and green is in the strategy category. We're mostly looking at the overall here. This is the blue, and this is compared to everything, apps, games, everything. So you'll see, they fall off pretty quickly. Their game doesn't get much visibility. It's not seen, like people aren't seeing it because it's not on the top of the charts. But they have an insane curve here. They're grossing, they're like making so much money, they're on top of everybody else. So what that proves is the game continues to monetize very, very well despite uh, the p people no longer downloading it. Um, so even the virality mechanisms are, maybe aren't super effective. So I wouldn't look at a game like this to try to get more vi uh, to get ideas for uh, virality uh, mechanisms. But I would definitely look at this to see how to retain players over time and how to monetize those players. This is the ideal situation. So they're always awesome. I mean, to look at this is, is great, and you should look at their game for a lot of... Um, uh, uh, inspiration, but you can see there's a very close correlation, even though they're still not even on the very top of the charts anymore, but I mean, it's very hard to maintain that position, but their curve is ridiculous. So, like, if you're looking at making a game similar to them, I obviously would recommend that you look at what they've done, but there are other, plenty of other similar games that you should look at when you're putting together a game, because cloning them necess isn't necessarily going to mean that you're going to make uh, more money, because they've already done it. You've got to do one thing better. So looking at different games, getting ideas from different places is always a good, uh, good idea and a good plan. Uh, but this is a good place to start. So they, they have an ideal monetization model. So okay, with that all said and done, I think um, we're gonna, I want to take a step back and look more from an academic perspective. Um, to just so you guys understand, I think understanding on how this stuff works will help you um, build solutions for your own products. And I should say that um, some of the inspiration here, I, there was a, a great GDC talk um, done by Emily Greer on maximizing monetization. And I, followed, I looked at her slides and they, she presented the information in a very good and clear manner. And so I kind of followed that here because I think that um, that's probably the best way of explaining it to you guys. So let's take a look. So uh, let's review economics. This is the very basic economics you can do. And like I said, I don't have financial background. I just done this research myself on the web. So this is, when you type in supply and demand in Google, this is what you're going to get. You're going to get this graph. And it's a very, very popular graph. This is what they do when they first teach you about mon uh, economics. So just explaining what that means um, is that like, the more you raise your price, generally, um, the less people are going to want it because it gets more expensive. It's pretty common sense. So you'll see in here the curve of demand. So the demand drops. The quantity that people are wanting drops as you increase your price. And adverse, adversely, um, supply increases. So using an example like if I'm selling cookies and I have 10 cookies, I, I bake 10 cookies and I'm going on the street to sell them and I price them at 1,000 Colombian pesos. 
and I sell them in 10 minutes. Well, that's kind of useless because now I, I clearly didn't price them properly because now I don't, I, I'm losing time not selling more of them. They were clearly in high demand. So th the idea here is trying to find the point at which you can price them and continue to sell them until you make your next batch of cookies, so which may be the next evening and then for the next day in which you sell them. So you probably want to try pricing them the next day at $3 or $5 and keep raising that price until you find out, until you find that exact point in which it breaks even. Now, so the great example is the stock market. If you guys know anything about stocks, I really don't, but I know enough that this is very similar to the model they follow. This is like the perfect model. Um, but the good news, <laughs> this is just giving you a basis. This doesn't apply to digital games. There is no supply. In games, it's all digital. So like the games just get copied as people continue to buy more. But this ties into my next point, um, which is very important to point out this perfect competition. So what perfect competition means is that all the products that are similar that you're selling, whether it's games, cookies, ice cream, they're all identical. So that, because you're competing against other people in this kind of market, and so when you're trying to find your price, if you price it higher than they are, people will um, buy the cheaper ice cream or the cheaper cookies. But um, when things aren't equal, and I think I have an example here, so this assumes that all goods are what are known as homogenous, um, and homogenous goods are those that are interpreted to be physically identical or viewed as identical by the consumer. But that's not always true. You look at like Ben and Jerry's ice cream and Baskin Robbins, are they identical? Do people see and want to buy, oh, well, Ben and Jerry's is cheaper, so I'm just going to buy Ben and Jerry's. In some cases, yes, but in a lot of cases, some people really like the, the taste of Ben and Jerry's ice cream or Baskin Robbins ice cream. And so they'll go and they'll, they'll be willing to spend more money because they like one thing over the other. So that model, this model back here, where it doesn't quite apply. Um, but the great news is that only you as a game developer and the creator of your own game can sell goods in your own game. Ignoring gold farmers, of course. I mean, people that go and then sell their accounts online. So if you're making a free-to-play game and you sign up for an account, you can sell that account after you've already raised a lot of money. Um, so this is awesome. Every game, and this is uh, like a revelation, or a revelation that like we came to, um, that... Every game is its own monopoly. Players are not going around looking at games and looking at how much like, they sell their coin packs, the stuff that they sell in the game. They're not looking at the price of those things. They're looking at the price of the game, and they're looking at the game if it's something that um, appeals to them. But they're not looking at the price of the coin packs. So that is a very good point to kind of exploit and kind of really focus and dwell on. And I actually ran an experiment just for this presentation, and I'll show you in just a minute a couple slides on how this worked out. Um, but there is a fierce competition amongst uh, getting those players. Um, Joel had done a great uh, talk yesterday on the cost of uh, acquiring new users. And a few years ago, I remember, I think it was, I think it was maybe two years ago, Maybe, yeah, maybe two years ago. I think it was a dollar fifty to two fifty. So you can pay an advertiser a dollar fifty or two fifty, and they will guarantee to get your game on somebody's device. So you're paying to get them to get that game on their device. As of two weeks ago, according to Joel's research, um, it's now six dollars. So it's very, very expensive to get your game in front of people. So. This is a problem, and this is the biggest problem that we kind of need to solve when building a game and trying to make money. Not so much about the, uh, the price of the stuff that you sell in the game. And also, players that don't like how you treat them will just stop playing your game. There's so much other stuff out there, they're just going to leave. So a great example is a paywall. For those of you who know or do not know what a paywall is, um, paywalls are a point in the game where you make it so hard that people have to spend money to progress. Um, and so they'll get stuck at that point. Um, and it, it gets players really mad. And the thing is, most players don't spend money. The majority of players spend money after they've been playing the game for a while. After they've felt that, like, they've invested a lot of time and, and, and well, they're, like, even if they started spending money, like, they started investing money and time into the game, that's when they start really spending more money. So you don't want to turn those players off. 
And the players that are developers who don't understand how to uh, properly introduce these mechanics to sell stuff in games are the ones that generally fail. You have to do it at a certain pace, and I'll talk about that in a bit. So let's talk a little bit about elasticity. This is another concept um, in economics, and I'm just going to briefly touch on it. So it's really, according to Wikipedia, the definition is it's the measurement of how changing one economic variable affects other economic variables. Um, more particularly for the context of my presentation, we're interested in, in knowing how changing the price affects people's interest in buying those items or the game. Um, so when you increase the price, like we talked about before, the demand will generally uh, decrease very quickly if the good is elastic. So, and your, your, the money that you're bringing in will drop. So like if you try to raise the price on something and, and players are like, oh, this is too much for this game, they stop playing it. But when something's inelastic, people will continue to buy it regardless. You raise the price, people will still continue to spend money on it. And your, your total money will increase. So if I'm charging, I don't know, 1,000 Colombian pesos for a cookie, and I decide to now charge 3,000 Colombian pesos for a cookie, if I'm still selling that same number of cookies, my total, the total amount of money I walk away with is much higher. So let's see here. Um, some of the examples of elasticity. Can, uh, candy is very elastic because um, people don't need candy and there's a lot of alternatives. If I run a candy store and I'm selling candy and I try to price it too high, people are just uh, going to go to other candy stores. They can find it elsewhere. And if all candy rises, people will just stop buying candy because they don't need candy. Same thing with furniture. I mean, you can always find alternatives to like cheaper furniture, used furniture. So if furniture stores will have, cha like, have challenges. By, they have to be very careful with how they price their furniture so that... Um, they get the, uh, the appropriate number of buyers and that then maximizes their revenue. Examples of inelastic goods or inelastic products are electricity. People need electricity um, to live generally. Um, and people are, no matter how high you price it, there's a point at which people will stop buying or will stop spending. They'll conserve power and try to go out more. But generally, you raise the price of uh, electricity and the the money that is brought in will also increase. And the same thing, the, the classic example is gasoline. Uh, you raise the price of gas, people need gas to get around. Some people will start carpooling and whatnot, but it's generally very elastic and hence why gas prices have been on the rise in the last several years. So this is another question for you guys. I know I don't want to keep boring you up here by just rambling on. So what do you guys think are virtual goods? So goods that are in the game. So who thinks it's elastic? Raise the hands. Anybody elastic? Okay, how about inelastic? Elastic. Yeah, that's very interesting. I actually thought the exact same thing. I actually thought that virtual goods were elastic. But in fact, virtual goods are mostly inelastic, and that's amazing. This is a major point in making money in games. By knowing this point, I'm gonna show you in a slide or so of that, that test that I did, and you'll see how this works. So there are some exceptions. So like if you're making a game and you're targeting a younger crowd, um, and so you really gotta know your audience. When you make a game, you can't just follow what everybody else done. You gotta understand the type of game that you're building and understanding how to best make money from it. So if you're targeting, if you're making an educational game, um, you're targeting kids, and kids, unless it's their parents buying for them, they don't generally have a lot of money, so they won't spend money. Um, so you need to price your goods cheaper. By increasing the price, people will tend to stop buying. They're just like, this is just too expensive for me. So they tend to be more elastic. Um, so they, uh, let's see, I talked about that. Okay, but if you look at the most, uh, some of the top grossing games, you'll see almost none of them price their consumables at a dollar. The cheapest buy-in is generally $2, $3, $4, some even five, six. It's actually crazy. And they, they know this because of the way that virtual goods are inelastic. And they know that nobody else can sell that the good in their game. So I'm going to show you the, uh, the example I've been mentioning. So our cheapest coin pack that we had in our game was $2. This was as of August 27th. I ran this test just to prove a point here for this presentation. And so on August 28th, I increased it by 50%. I added a dollar to it. So from $2 to $3. And if you see this graph... Right here, this is the week. So we, we look at it from every, I, I try to look, parse the data for every Thursday or every 
day of the week, you can't look at it from Wednesday to Thursday or Thursday to Friday or Friday to Saturday because weekends people have more time and they generally spend money differently. So I try to look at like all Thursdays or all Saturdays or something like that as a better uh, metric. So uh, it's hard to see here, but actually we got, we sold the exact, well, we are one unit off from the exact same number of units as the week before. And we were adult, we just increased the price. We just increased the revenue by 50% by doing nothing, just by, well, essentially just raising the price of the good. And people are still, the people that were gonna buy goods are gonna buy goods. And, and that's, that's the end of it. They're, they're the people that know that they can't get it elsewhere, they're paying for the convenience, and that's just how it is. Now you gotta be careful, if you raise it too high, what happens is you, you lose the conversion. So people, it's a, there's a big trick and a big balance in games trying to get people to spend their first dollar because once they spend the first dollar, they're now invested. And if you turn, it off, turn them off by charging $10, it's really challenging because you're getting fewer people that are spending money long term. So you don't want to go too high, but you really should run experiments. And just like I did here, and this is something that it was because of this presentation that made me do it, that I didn't realize that, yes, this, this actually in effect works. So demand for virtual goods, um, just briefly touched on all, all these. So it's the desirability, how uh, people, how much, how badly people want that good. Um, their ability to pay, like I said, high school students don't generally have a lot of money. So if they can't afford it, it doesn't matter how you price it. They're just not gonna be able to buy it. And then the total players in the market. If you have a very small number of people, it's not really gonna lead to a lot of uh, sales. But so like I mentioned before, make sure that your pricing aligns with your target audience. If you're building a game for high school students, make sure you understand that and you price accordingly. So Wales, just want to really touch on this and I'm not gonna go into detail, but I just want to make one major point. So Whale is somebody that's known as a person that spends a lot of money on your game. And the reason this is important is because they make up the, to the majority of revenue. Um, I don't have a lot of data myself from the games that we've done. We've only released three games, but even from our data, we've seen um, that like you're talking like 75% of like your money will come from these people that spend generally a uh, hundred dollars or more. So I quoted Congregate in that article or the um, the presentation that I mentioned earlier uh, because they have a much larger range of games in their portfolio, and they say that like. Every top 10 game gets the majority of their money from people spending over $100 on their game. So, okay, let's really quickly talk about the types of virtual goods because this leads into knowing um, what uh, sells well and so you know how to build your game for it. But again, it's not a perfect solution. Like, there's no one size fits all. Um, you have to, again, cater to your game. So uh, I'm gonna use some terms here. There's things called convenience items that we refer to. These are items that give players temporary boosts in their game. Um, for example, an experience boost. Uh, so people pay for the convenience of getting and playing the game quicker. Um, these are things that either are uh, long lasting or very short duration. Then there's content, and I think most people understand what this is. This is like new levels or new characters or new things that the player can then explore. Um, so like a level or stage in the game. There's these things called, we call permanents or, or non-consumables. And these are things that um, provide the player with permanent upgrades. So think of it like a weapon, a weapon that you get forever. You get it in the game and you can continue to use that weapon as you uh, play the game. And then there's the opposite of that, which are impermanence or consumables. And these are items that um, you can use, that you spend. Like in Field Runners 2, one of the uh, consumable items or impermanent items are landmines. We sell landmines to our players. They place them, they kill some of the units, but then they have to buy more to keep play if they uh, are finding it very effective and very useful for them. And then the last one is cosmetic items. These are things like generally, um, like a Christmas hat, like a Santa hat would be an example of a cosmetic item. Things that only change the visual look of, of something in the game. So there's a lot of options here and a lot of games don't actually explore all these um, because it, again, based on what kind of game they're building. So again, asking you guys, I'm very curious to see what, your, uh, what you think actually uh, sells well because I had my own theories before I actually dug, uh, dug into this. So who thinks it's content? Who thinks new levels actually sell well in a game. New levels, new levels. Yes. We did the same with Field Runners 1. So 
Uh, I can have some, I'll, I'll tell you about how that w uh, worked for us. Convenience items. These are things that are, yeah, convenience items? Yes, okay, so these are things that people buy. They like usually, I think there, it was mentioned already several times on buying time. So if you do have a mechanic in the game where you do something and it takes time for that to happen, you can buy your way and just get that, make that happen immediately. Cosmetic items, like Santa hats, okay. Uh, permanent items like weapons, interesting. Um, and then things that you spend over and over again. It seems like it's pretty evenly broken down, which is very interesting because there's one of these that sells very, very well, and a lot of the other ones don't sell well at all. So what is it? Players want permanent upgrades. Players want weapons. Players want things that make them better in the game for the long term. A lot of people see examples by games that they, these convenience items that do do fairly well, but they don't even come close to these permanent upgrades. So you see, in Field Runners 2, I'll use the example, and I can't really speak on behalf of like certain things. We don't have cosmetic items in Field Runners 2. But um, we do sell non-consumables, so we these uh, weapons, essentially. They're the towers in our game. They make up 70% 70, 70 of all of our money that comes in, and like 70% of all of our uh, uh, in-app purchases, which make up 50% of our total, or a little more than 50% of our total. It's the consumable items like landmines that make up uh, only 30%. And I should also mention, I know a lot of you are taking pictures and stuff. I mean, I've shared all these slides. I think they're going to be made available at the end of the conference. I mean, feel free to take pictures, but um, you're going to have access to all of this at the end of the conference as well. Um, and so here's the, the pecking order or the, uh, the order in which players demand different types of items. So permanents are at the top. And then impermanence and convenience items fall second. Cosmetic falls third, so like Santa hats and stuff. The thing that actually does the worst are those additional levels. And it's very surprising because that content is the most, generally for a developer, the most expensive to make. And it's funny that it sells the least. And I'll talk about why in just a second. So consumables, so according to Congregate, they have over 200 games in their portfolio, and they said the same thing. They say between 10 and 30% of their Money comes in from consumables, which matches. We're on the higher end of that range, but matches almost perfectly with what our numbers are. And I actually didn't even see this until I crunched these numbers, and I'm like, wow, this, this matches like identically. So pro, pros and cons, and let's see how I'm doing on time. Yeah. I'm good? OK. Um, permanent, so very quickly. Permanence, uh, there's a, a high demand because a lot of players like the advantage that they get indefinitely. And so those are great items, too, to kind of get, make people buy their very first item. Um, but higher development costs, permanent items are tricky because you can only sell them once. You make a weapon, they buy it, that's it. You can't resell that item. That's, that's, that's I mean, you're going to keep making more stuff, which gets costly. Um, but they do satisfy, particularly the big spenders. People have spent a lot of money in your game will spend it on these items. The impermanence, these are very tough. These are the consumables, like these are the landmines, like I said, in Field Runners 2, and they're difficult to price high because they're temporary. Players use them, and then they have to buy more. And then players get kind of a little frustrated. You can't price them high. You can't charge $10 for them because nobody wants to spend that kind of money on something that just goes away. So it's difficult to price high. I mean, if you're smart and you can find a good mechanic that works, great, and more, more power to you. Um, cosmetics, again, we don't sell cosmetic items. Looking at their data, they say across all their games, they don't sell well. And it makes some money again, but it's not really generally worth the, the investment. But cosmetic items, they do have an advantage in that they can help sell the permanent items that you sell up here. So weapons, you make a cool looking weapon, that's going to sell. I mean, people are going to want to have the cool looking weapon to show off to their friends. Where, so then those you can price high. So if you are smart and you combine this with that, you'll generally get a pretty good return. A very good example from outside of games. So I buy shoes because I have to have shoes to protect my feet as I walk around. Um, but I will spend more money on something that looks good. Like I don't want a crappy pair of shoes because then everybody will make fun of me. So <laughs> uh, that's how th this logic works here.
and content. This is the one that I think that, like, I even saw a lot of hands go up, and I even thought the same, and it actually did very well for us in Field Runners 1, because that's all we sold in Field Runners 1. We only sold levels. It worked well for us because we had very little content. As I mentioned, when we launched the game, we had one level. So there wasn't a whole lot. People were really looking for more. Um, but content usually only applies to those that already beat the game, that are already like really invested into your game. So you don't generally sell that until they played through your whole game. And with the amount of games out there today, it's very hard and very unusual for somebody to beat your game. So this is why this doesn't sell generally, and it's very expensive. So if you're not smart and you're just making a game and you're saying this would be cool, and you as a gamer, I know myself, I love content. I play a game all the way through and I keep playing. And I think, and most developers are like that. And I'll do the, the, so I'll be thinking, I'm making this game, well, this would be really cool if I can make this cool expansion. But unfortunately, it's not what people want. Uh, so take your feedback with a grain of salt. Be very careful with the, the feedback that people and players are giving to you because it's generally the ones that um, are very passionate. It's these guys, the whales, the people that are very invested into your game that are very vocal, that are very interested in giving you ideas. So be careful. Don't look at other games and look at the feedback because it's going to be biased. It's going to be the people that are really love the, those games or really hate those games. And so they're going to mostly tell you content is where it's at. That's what they want to see. I get people all the time coming to me saying, oh, your game needs more levels. And like we already have over 30 hours of gameplay, which I personally think when we launched was way too much. Because most play, even looking at our data, most players don't play through the whole game. So I think it's important to be very careful. So I'm going to quickly run through these slides. I'm running out of time. So uh, avoid diminishing returns. Um, you don't want it. So like, again, with the permanents, but if you're selling weapons, if you sell a weapon, they can only buy the weapon once. You want to be careful uh, not to prevent players from, um, uh, like some players really want to uh, give you more money because they really like your game. And so if you only put in permanents, they can't give you more money. This is very rare, and this is an experiment we ran when we launched Field Runners 1 way back in 2008 because nobody knew how the market was working back then. We actually took donations. We had no idea how this market was working. We set this up and we said, okay, if people like our game, we didn't really think it was going to sell that well. We put up donations. People were donating large amounts of money. And that kind of ties into this stuff right here. You don't want to prevent players that really like your game from spending that money. So, yeah, I talked about that. Um, so you want to try to keep players spending by uh, revealing items that are useful. Um, so you, another mistake that you can make is you make game, items that are only useful at the beginning of the game or only useful, useful at the end. Make sure that as your player plays through the game, there's always something that is interesting to them to buy. Because otherwise you're leaving money on the table. If they buy things in the beginning and then they get halfway through the game and they see that there's no need to buy stuff, then, why, uh, then you're losing money. Players will only spend as long as they see a benefit. So you want to make sure, like, players aren't stupid, even though despite what a lot of developers think, players aren't stupid. They're not going to spend money on dumb things that don't really have any benefit. So you got to make sure that whatever you put in your game actually makes sense in the context of your game and actually gives them an advantage to some degree. So um, this is a very important point, retention. Players only spend money as long as they're playing your game. If you have terrible retention and players aren't playing your game, then you're not going to sell anything. And that's like, I, as you saw in those graphs, like Rage of Muhammad was a very good example because they kept their players. People aren't downloading the game so much anymore, but those players are still playing every day and spending a lot of money. So it's very important to try to make sure that you keep your players. And one way of doing that is making sure your game is fun. I mean, I know a lot of people are looking at this and I kind of, I look, I look at this Columbia 3.0 conference, it's really great and all, but like I noticed that a lot of the talks are revolving around making money and not about making cool games. And I think that like we really need to focus and help developers understand how to make better games because that in the end is what sells. I mean, that's what gets players to sell because they're the things that get them really interested in wanting to continue to spend their money. Um, so the longer they play, and this is very, um, these are, there's a lot of data behind this. Um, the, the longer they play, the more likely they will spend, and because they've already invested their time, which is, I mean, money essentially. So they're now more willing to spend. So the longer you can keep them playing, the better off you'll be. 
Um, can't really see that so much, but so, um, so don't push too hard too early. Don't try to put all these ads all in the very beginning of the game, say buy this, buy that, buy this. Now, I should say that this is different based on different regions of the world. What works in the US may not work in China. So, because China, they're, they're used to different kinds of ways of introducing things, and those are things that you should, once you have a good system, you should start to look at in more specific detail. But like, if you push too early, you're gonna just turn the players away and they'll just leave your game. And I think a lot of free-to-play games, this is why it's got such a bad rep, a bad reputation. It's because they uh, try to sell too much. Some games that don't do it right just scare the players away. It's just like, I don't know if you guys ever played Duck Hunt, but you always want to shoot the dog when you lose, and you can never do it. It just gets you angrier because the dog is laughing at you. And Yeah, I don't know. I thought that was a very good example. Um, so, so the idea here is to sell few items in the beginning because players in the beginning are just exploring your game and they don't want to be bombarded and like shown all this stuff. So um, you want to be careful and just introduce things slowly. And at the end of the game, you want to make sure that you have a lot of things to sell because that's where the people that are, get to that point in your game are the big spenders. They are the whales. They are the ones that make up most of your money. So you want to have a lot of stuff for them to buy. And if you try to focus on the earlier game, you're just going to frustrate players, and you're just going to turn people away. And those big whales or those big players are never going to get to that point and spend that money. And like I said, you want to have lots of high-priced items at the end of the game. Okay, so um, this is also very important. And like, looking at data is great and all, but again, your game is very specific. It has, uh, even though it may be similar, it may be a tower defense game, it may have the same art style, but it's still very different from a lot of other games out there, so you need to play with these numbers. Again, a lot of developers think, ship the game, move on to the next game, because that was what game development was years ago. Mobile, the, game, the, the adventure just begins when you ship the game. I know this has been beaten into you guys. Of, if you've been to the other talks, they've been saying the same thing. But you need to really focus on after you launch the game and actually finding ways to generate and continuing to make more money. And so you need to experiment. And that, like, there's no real good way of doing that other than just uh, trying and fiddling with things and seeing what works and where you, you, you even out. So, but it's always generally good practice to initially price items high because it's always easier to lower than raise. As you know, like when you launch a game, launching at 99 cents and then trying to raise it to like three or five bucks, really hard. Um, you get a lot of bad backlash. But if you launch high and you pull it back, people are generally happy, generally. <laughs> Sometimes, <laughs> Field Runners 1, we launched, we launched at $5 and we brought it down to $3, we did a sale. And then we went to $2 and we back, went back up to three dollars, trying to find that point. We were experimenting, and uh, players were like, "It's kind of ridiculous." But players like, "I want my dollar back. I spent three dollars, not two dollars," and it was just kind of insane. So, but generally, it works out. Um, taking advantage of promotions, particularly trying to promote items that you know are doing well, collecting data on the things that sell well, and actually trying to really push those in front of the player because those are the ones that tend to what players find to have the biggest benefit. Um, but be careful because play, the people's purchasing habits change during promotions. When you put something on sale, people see sale and they're like, I gotta get this thing. They don't even care what it is. So you can't really, a lot of times, so you can't really just base it on the fact that you put it cheaper or on promotion. So. Um, this is a very uh, important fact, and you'll see, um, looking at App Annie, you'll, you'll, you, if you look at a lot of the top games, you'll see that this is what most of them do. App Annie, again, is good not in just the graphs, but they actually have, uh, it's kind of cut off here, but so you see right here, they actually track events. They track when the price of a game changes, and they track when a, a new version of the game's released. And you'll see, like even in here in our example, we put it on sale, and we also update it in the same day. And that is extremely powerful. Like if you do a sale and then an update and then a sale, it's not the same as doing both at the same time. It's like putting a lot of push behind it and you can see we had a huge jump every time we do that. And if you look at any other games, like Infinity Blade does the same. I know we lose that. That's where we kind of got the idea. We saw these other uh, games doing it and it was very effective for them. And then we tried it and it worked very well for us. Again, Appiani. Can't, can't stress that enough. It's free, so you can't go wrong. 
Um, cross promotions are also very effective. It's difficult for new developers now, unless you're finding publishing partners, um, to do cross promotions. But if you have a partner that can do uh, help you, that helps a lot. We get so many sales. I think most of our sales, like the biggest push that we ever had, even more effective than the sale and the um, update, is by having pushing all of our users from one of our products to another. And you can't even, I should make a note here, that you can't actually do this in paid games. You can advertise games if you do it carefully. You don't do it like a lot of people use the default blue pop-up that says, get this game now, and players kind of takes them out of the game, and they, 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 they lose the immersion, and it's a little frustrating. It looks like an ad. But if you, you hide it correctly, you can do very well and disguise it and make people think, wow, I really like this game. I'm going to check out this other game that they're recommending to me. As long as you don't do it like every time they go into the game, you're going to get them really angry, especially if they paid for the game, because then they're saying I paid and I have ads in this game. But if you do it once a week, actually I should say a story. Um, I was talking to Keith Shepard, who did Temple Run. And what he does is once a week, he'll push some game in his paid Temple Run game, and, uh, and he gets no backlash from his consumers. Once a week, as long as he doesn't do it more than that, it works fine. So just be very careful. Um, yeah, and also with promotions, also be careful because if you don't do it, again, don't just take all this stuff. You've got to try it. Experiment, experiment. Because if you do it, uh, you just put it on sale, then uh, you don't plan it out. Um, you, can potentially, you can potentially hurt your game. Okay, so I'm, gonna rec I'm running really low on time, so I'm just going to kind of skip this slide here. Um, or actually just go over really quick. Um, this, these are pretty common things you can find on the web. You can, uh, like just ways of promoting your game. Um, again, you can check out the slides at the end of the conference. Uh, final thoughts. So every game's unique. I've said this a hundred times. Um, constantly monitor, adapt, experiment. Um, if your retention is low, that is the key. Make sure, that is what you want to focus on. This first. Making sure your game retains their players. And for that to happen, the game has to be fun. If it's not fun, then you're not going to make any money, really. I mean, maybe for a short burst, but that's about it. I mean, until the players realize that you fooled them. This is my very last slide. Um, so I'm get through here. So stay focused on building a fun game. Players that care about the game and their progress, well, there's a non montage. Two examples. So one is a review that we had. This guy here, and this is pretty common. I mean, you probably have heard this before, but this is one I just want to really make clear. So this guy, he says, I've been waiting for this day for like, uh, since the first iPhone came out. Field Runners 2 was our sequel. I, so he essentially saying he stole the first game, I bootlegged the first, and it was so awesome, so I bought it to give my support to the developers. And now finally Field Runners 2 is out. And I'm ent entirely okay with that. I know a lot of developers, like piracy sucks, but a lot of times players aren't going to buy your game unless they really want to support you. And so as long as you make a good game, like even you get people like this that stole it, but then decide to give you money. And this is another example of a congressman who was actually playing field runner, so you can see that it clearly is fun. It was during a con congressional hearing, and he was playing, so we got this, and we thought this was a really cool, cool <laughs> picture. So that's it. That's my presentation. Um, again, I'm Jamie Gotch. You can contact me at my email address. I actually just started this Twitter account, uh, so I have, I think, three followers, but uh, I just started it last week, so I haven't actually got it out there, but yeah, I plan to use that, so feel free to reach out to me on there. And I don't think we have time for Q&A, but it's just one question. Okay, so any questions? Awesome. Sure. Yes. So uh, one of the techniques that we use, and a lot of companies do this as well, is they do, well, they do what's called focus testing. So you experiment, you pull in people off the street while you're working on your game and say, hey, try my game. And you give them pizza or some free food and you let them try and you observe what they do. And generally, if you want to get real formal about it, you can set up cameras because sometimes they're not entirely truthful, especially if they're friends. They're like, oh, this game is great. Yeah, it's great. But um, if you monitor them with cameras, you can generally get their emotions as they're playing your game. That's one way. Another thing that companies generally do is they'll do soft, what are called soft launches, and they'll launch in like one country in the world for months in advance. Plants vs. Zombies 2 just did this. They launched in New Zealand. I, I, have few, I think they may have done Canada. I'm not sure. Um, and just to experiment and understand 
what works. Again, it all comes down to experimentation, finding out what kind of things in your game really sell and what people want. So uh, there's really no clear answer. I mean, it's just using your brain and not just following what everybody else has done because what works for one game doesn't work for another. Awesome. Well, thank you all and, uh, for attending this. And Thanks, Amy. So, uh, so this uh, next uh, conference, uh, esta siguiente conferencia va a ser Oscar Clark, es nuestro último conferencista, nuestro último panelista de la mañana. Luego tenemos un break de 45 minutos y tenemos a Darren Metzer y a Barbara Chamberlain con nosotros uh, para contarles un poco quién es 